Okay, recording is on. Good morning and welcome to uh, BC 106 on interpreting scripture. I think uh, this will be our final lecture today. Um, uh, we will cover a, a few more questions and then uh, with that we will wrap up and I will work on uh, getting the assignment ready for you uh, that you could do for this course and just be like a review for the course. Let's take a moment, we will pray and then we will get started. May I ask somebody to please lead us in prayer? Father, we thank you for this time. Lord, we submit us into your mighty presence. Lord, we pray as we continue to learn from your word. We pray, oh God, you speak to us. Help us understand the mysteries of your word, God, and help us to give the word to people around us in the right way, Lord. We thank you for this time. Bless this time of learning. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining the class today. So um, we are coming to the end of this course on interpreting scripture. And uh, we are right now uh, doing what we're calling as uh, handling difficult topics. Uh, obviously, we cannot cover every difficult topic. There are many different uh, questions, difficult questions, difficult uh, themes that uh, that are there and that people ask questions. But uh, we are trying to cover uh, some of the more common ones. So just to quickly review what we have done so far. In the very first uh, session in this in this chapter. We, we talked about uh, the Trinity. We talked about the Incarnation. Uh, we talked about just understanding uh, the titles that are used uh, for Jesus. So we, we did that first. Then we uh, spent a little bit of time um, talking about um, uh, what may seem like or what seems like um, contradictory uh, statements uh, in the Gospels, you know. So people will point out, hey, this the same story is, is, is said in a different way in this Gospel and this Gospel and so on. So how do we respond to that? And so we took up a few examples, not, not everything, but a few examples to uh, just to show us this is how, you know, we can actually look into it and we can respond. And also in the Gospels, there are difficult statements. So we took a few of those difficult statements, like what Jesus told Pilate or uh, what Jesus told his disciples about forgiving sins and uh, what Jesus said about himself, you know, uh, three days and three nights, uh, uh, as Jonah was in the belly of the fish. This would be that three days, three nights. So these are some things we looked at. And then after that, we changed a little bit and we were asking some other questions about uh, the, the spiritual gifts, our spiritual gifts for today. Um, can a woman be in fivefold ministry like apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist? Then uh, can, uh, can a woman teach the word of God in church? You know, so we asked those questions and we looked at some of the more common passages, the difficult passages that are used. Uh, we looked at First Corinthians chapter 14. Uh, we also looked at First uh, Timothy chapter 2. And then lastly, uh, we, uh, we looked at this whole issue about head covering. You know, um, is it necessary for women uh, to cover the head? So these are passages that generally uh, go into uh, this this the subject of women and the, the women's role in the church and etc. So those are the common questions. So today, um, I want just to uh, look at a, a, a few questions about um, having to do with 
uh, salvation. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, so we'll just, I'll just maybe pick up maybe two, two questions on this subject of salvation. And then, um, you know, we will leave a time open where, uh, you know, if there are other themes or topics that you would like to ask, please feel free to ask uh, your questions uh, on that. And then with that, you know, we will close, we will end up, we'll end today. And uh, what I will do is I will prepare a, uh, the assessment questions uh, based on the entire course. There will be three portions. We'll break it up into three, sec three assessments. Um, uh, covering the entire course. So it'll help you review all the notes. Just go through it and answer those questions just as a review. And it will also give you a grade, right? So uh, don't don't stress yourself out about the assessment. It's look at it more as a review of the course. The questions are to help you review the course. And then in the process, you will get your grade, right? So I will put that out uh, in the next couple of days. And uh, with that, you know, the course will end. So today, we want to talk about the issue of salvation. Now, we all agree, all of us as believers, we agree that uh, salvation is through Jesus Christ alone. That means there's only one Savior, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, there is no other Savior. There's no other uh, means a way by which we can be saved. And we all agree that we are saved by grace through faith. And Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 is a very familiar scripture that uh, uh, we are all saved by grace. That means God's grace and our faith. So we are saved only through the Lord Jesus Christ and by grace through faith. Now that is something we all agree. But then in relation to salvation, there are two questions that are kind of uh, debated quite a bit in the Christian church. And so I just wanted to address that. The first one is about water baptism. The question is, is water baptism necessary for salvation? You know, is it necessary for salvation? So, you you know, we have people on both sides. That means there are, I'm talking about Christians, believers. There are some who will say yes, and some who will say not necessary. So, But let us look at both views, right? And, and then try to arrive at... Uh, uh, an answer. So the question is, is water baptism necessary for salvation? First question. Another question, which again in relation to salvation, which is a, a question that is debated by believers, by Christians, is can a believer lose their salvation? That means a person who is saved who is a believer, can a believer lose their salvation? That's the second question. And we have to find out what the Bible has to say. Right? So now, when we, let's talk about the first one. Right? Is water baptism necessary for salvation? Now, on the one side, we have people who will quote scripture like, uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 16. You know, in Mark 16, verse 15, Jesus said, go and preach the gospel to every creature. Then in the next verse, he said, whoever, is be whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. So they will say, you know, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Or we can use the great the scripture text of the Great Commission. Jesus said, go make disciples. You know, Matthew 28, 
He said, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So they say, only you, if you're baptized, can you be a disciple? So, uh, and then Peter's sermon, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, at least these three passages are used to, to state or to emphasize that baptism, water baptism, is necessary for salvation. That is one side, one side. But then on the other side, you have believers who will say, well, water baptism is not necessary for salvation. We are saved by grace through faith. But water baptism is a command, which is to be obeyed, of course. But it is an expression of your salvation. So we are saved by grace through faith. But everybody who is saved has to become a disciple. And part of becoming a disciple is to express that through water baptism, to express that you are decided to be a disciple of Jesus. And also it's an expression of the fact that you have been saved. So that's the other side. So we have both sides, you know, who, and all, all these are believers, all these are good people. I'm not saying anybody's bad. You know, they're good believers. But you have both sides arguing or debating. And uh, the people who say that uh, water baptism is necessary for salvation will make it mandatory in some churches. It's mandatory. Only after you're baptized can you take part in the Holy communion. Only after you're baptized can you become a member of the church. Only after you're baptized will they can you get married. So it becomes a, a, a prerequisite for many other things. Because they believe water baptism is necessary for salvation. Therefore it becomes necessary for all the other things. So let us try to to see what you know, what is what should be our thinking, our way of thinking. So I want to hear from you. I've given you know both sides, and all these are believers, all these are Christians, uh, both sides. Uh, what are your thoughts? How would you look at it based on scripture? Based on the entirety of scripture, what do you think is the correct position we must take? Any thoughts? It doesn't matter. No right or wrong. It's just we are sharing. We are discussing. Okay. So don't be afraid. Just, just share your thoughts. Um, I think it is uh, important to get water baptized as, um, as believers. Um, and also we cannot prohibit anyone taking from communion just because they have not baptized. Um, so I believe baptism cannot serve as a prerequisite uh, for membership or communion or uh, even marriage, I believe. But I think um, it, as Christians, as we are honoring what Jesus said, we should get water baptized. That's mm. my thought. Mm. So is it, is it necessary for salvation? I mean... I, I agree that you know we have to obey his command to be water baptized, but is a believer suppose a believer receives Christ and dies without being water baptized? Will he go to heaven? Will he go to hell? Um, I think uh, in in cases like a, a person who is getting saved in a very um, late age and he's not able to get baptized through his, because of his physical condition, um, God won't deny the uh, salvation or entry into heaven just because of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I see Subhashis. I see your comments. Uh, Collins, please share your thoughts. 
Uh, Pastor, according to me, I really think that uh, salvation is like a bath. It has a process. There is a book that I read so many, like 20 years ago, it was called A No More Question Bath by a man they called David Paulson. He put salvation into four steps, into four stages. Number one, repentance to God, because I think we did transgress his laws. Number two, baptism in water. One must be, no, believe. Number two is to believe in Jesus Christ that he died for our, cro uh, for our sins on the cross. Number three is being baptized in water, mass water, be maybe a river, maybe a, po a pool. These days, people even have baptism pools in church. And number four, the last stage is receiving the Holy Spirit. So it is the rubber principle he calls it without the uh, without the vowels, R I U B B E R. But you remove the vowels, which is U and E. So it is the R B B R principle. So that's what I think. I think, according to your question, to cut it short, baptism, water baptism, is a prerequisite. It, it must take place. Not the sprinkling of water on people's heads. It should be, because it really shows two things. Baptism in water shows two things. One is death of the old, that old you who was before, before, before you will receive the, the, the uh, salvation, and three, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So it is twofold. The, you cannot have that normal birth without those two things. So baptism is very important, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, sir. Mm. Mm. Yes. Okay, Nicholson, please share. Please share your thoughts. Pastor, um, so as I had mentioned, I think you can take part in communion and uh, it is not required for salvation because one baptism is such it is a physical you're show, showing to others that physically you are baptized in the water like uh, Lubeka said you're being baptized and you come up the resurrection Christ died and rose again but mm. it is the circumcision of the heart it is a transformation within so mm. uh you can have people baptized and just for the sake of getting married and they could still be living different lives. So if there's no mm. transformation within, it, there's no point in the baptism. Mm. So that is one point. Um, the other point is, um, sorry, skip my head. <laughs> then you, you said it is not required for salvation. Yeah, yeah it is uh, not required for salvation because one first of all like john had also mentioned it is a it's a gift it's by grace and god gives it freely and if it is free then there's no other requirements it, if god says it's given freely as a gift you don't say take the gift but do this 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 of course we follow commandments and we love god and we do that but it is a free gift so it it is it, it contradicts this point of a free gift if mm. you have so many things to do after you receive salvation yeah good that good, good yeah and i see others uh, comments on the chat thank you for sh sharing um yeah i see your comments so let's try to think this through right so we need to like we said um in in our study of uh, uh, I yes I'm, go uh, ahead Mm -hmm. The salvation is not a must uh, for salvation. Baptism is not a must for salvation, but it is desirable. Mm -hmm. uh, thief in the cross did not have an opportunity to be baptized. And also, we read that Paul elsewhere says, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. So, one can be saved, but it is desirable since the scripture talks about it. Good. And when, yeah. he, when he comes to the maturity, one must be baptized. Hmm. Good. So thank you all for sharing. So what we must do, one of the things we learned 
uh, in interpreting scripture is whenever we, we're trying to answer a good question, we need to look at the entirety of the scripture on that subject, right? So we should not take one or two verses, uh, or, but we look at the entirety. What is the New Testament present, right? So here we are dealing with two things. We are dealing with salvation, the eternal salvation of a person. Secondly, we are do, dealing with the act of baptism, right? The, uh, is the act of baptism. Now, we agree that the New Testament teaches water baptism is only by immersion, right? So the word baptize simply means immerse, to submerge. So as Colin was pointing out, it's not sprinkling, but it's immersion. You have to go under the water and come out, you know, wherever the water is, whether it's a river or a pond or whatever, but you go in and come out. And it's because it's also very symbolic, it's uh, as... Paul explains in Romans 6, the death, burial, and resurrection. But these are two things. There is salvation, there is water baptism. And the question we are asking is, is salvation or is water baptism necessary for salvation? Is it necessary for salvation? So let's look at the entirety of scripture. So when you talk about salvation, and how do we distinguish? When you talk about salvation, salvation is a spiritual experience. Water baptism is a physical event that is denoting a spiritual experience. That means you're doing something physically. You're going under the water. You're coming out of the water, which is representing a spiritual experience truth that is you've got you're dead buried and resurrected with Christ but salvation itself is a spiritual experience that means your spirit is saved you're going from death to life from darkness to light from being outside of the kingdom of God to coming into the kingdom of God so these are two distinct things one is entirely spiritual one is a physical now what does the Bible teach about salvation? Salvation, like we said, is through faith in Christ. And it's all by grace through faith. So the moment we say it's grace through faith, we cannot attach any work to it. If we attach uh, any work to it, example, water baptism. Well, why do you say water baptism? When if, if, you, if you emphasize water baptism, you can emphasize tithing because the Bible teaches tithing. We can emphasize praying. The Bible teaches praying. We, you know, we can emphasize worship. All these, these are activities we do, but we cannot attach them to salvation because it's entirely by grace through faith. It is the gift of God. If it's a gift, I can't do even one small thing to earn it. The moment I do something, then to earn it, then I, it's no longer a gift. But a gift can be thrown away. That's a different matter. So somebody gives me a gift. I receive it freely. They don't charge me for receiving it. So I've received it. But a gift can be discarded. That's a different issue. But receiving the gift and me having the gift is 100% free. It's a free gift. The free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, right? So now in the New Testament, what do you see water baptism? It's an expression of salvation. It is not the cause for salvation. If we say a person has to be baptized to be saved, we are saying water baptism becomes a cause for salvation. The only cause for salvation is Christ's work on the cross. We cannot add to it. But it's an expression of salvation. So is it a command? Yes. Just like the command to forgive, the command to give, the command to love. It's all these are commands. And what a baptism is a command. A disciple is commanded to love. John 13, 35, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So, if I say that I cannot be saved until I am water baptized, then we should add to the list, you cannot be saved until you love every person. 
because he said, you will be known as a disciple until you love, right? And we can add all the other things that are the marks of a disciple. You know, if you're going to say, make, make these marks of a disciple a prerequisite for salvation, you have to be consistent in your interpretation of scripture. We can't just emphasize one, right? So, so I'm sharing, you know, the analysis. How do you analyze this? How do you analyze this? Then, you know, if you look at other scriptures, like a man must be born of water and spirit. The water in John 3, is he referring to natural birth or is he referring to water baptism? There is no mention of water baptism in John 3. So the context will tell you what water is. He's not talking about water baptism in John 3. He's e either referring to natural birth because that's the immediate context or the other thing about water is the word of God itself is water. So water and spirit. And that can be backed up by, you know, First Peter 1, 23, you're born again by the word of God. Right. So John 3, 5, born of water and spirit. The water cannot be talking about water baptism because it's not in the context. And the context is natural birth versus spiritual birth. What is of the flesh? What is of the spirit? And by extension, the water there can only represent the word of God because First Peter 1.23, you're born again by the word of God, right? So we cannot use John 3 water to talk about water baptism. It's incorrect. So I'm just saying, you know, okay, we analyze all the verses, all the things. Now, uh, so, you know, if we say salvation and water baptism are two sides of the same coin, I'm responding to what Colin said, then on the other side of the coin, you, we have to attach everything else, you know, giving, because that is a mark of a disciple. Love, that's a mark of a disciple. Belonging to a, <clears throat> belonging to a local church, that's a requirement for a disciple. All these things we have to attach. Then what happens? Salvation no longer is a free gift. So we have to keep salvation purely as a grace gift. The moment we make any, th any physical thing we do as a cause for salvation, then salvation is no longer a free gift of God. Whatever it is, whether it's praising, worshipping, being part of a local church, giving money, loving people, whatever. You cannot make it as a prerequisite. So, in our analysis, that means you look at all of Scripture, salvation is purely by grace through faith as a free gift. Three things about salvation. It's grace, free, and it's, and it's by faith. So the only thing a person can do to receive salvation is to have faith. That's the only thing. And we are born again. You were born from above. Now, to keep that gift, so that I have received the gift, but for me to keep that gift, safeguard that gift, I have to walk in obedience. Right? So God gives it to me. He says, here, take the gift. So I receive it. But then he says, now, keep it safe. Because a gift can be discarded. A gift can be lost. Right? I have to keep it safe. To keep that, then I have to follow his commandments, which all the commandments for a believer, one of which is being baptized, walking in love, being part of a local church. These are commandments for the New Testament believer. Worshipping God, feeding on the word of God, you know, uh, all these things. So these Obedience helps me keep the free gift of salvation. Obedience does not earn salvation. Salvation is given by grace as a free gift through faith. But in to, for me to keep that gift safely, I have to obey everything the New Testament teaches. So that is where water baptism comes in.
That is where loving God comes in. That is where loving people comes in. That is where you know all the other commands come in. They help us keep the gift, and that's why, you know, we can understand what uh, Paul said. You know, he said, "Work out your salvation." So he's not work for your salvation. No, you work it out. These are two different things. Salvation is received freely as a gift by faith. But now I work it out. That means now I live out this life of salvation, which includes water baptism. And everything has meaning. So water baptism has meaning. It's an expression of salvation uh, and so on. It's obedience to God. So that is the way I would... You know, you you're free to disagree with me. This is not a, <laughs> this is not a, what to say. Uh, you know, a com eleventh commandment. I'm just giving you my analysis. This is how you analyze scripture, and then you arrive at your decision, right? So, in our analysis, there are three things we have to three things we cannot uh, three things we have to maintain as far as salvation is concerned. That is, it is by grace. Second, it is a free gift. And third, it is through faith. Of course, the other elements, which is, it is in Christ only through Jesus, and because of what he did on the cross, only that, you know, salvation is through that. So that we have to maintain. We cannot compromise it. But we also have to maintain a life of obedience, that, which requires all these other things of water baptism, uh, you know, loving God, loving people, giving, fellowshipping in the church, local church, obedience to God, basically obedience. That is also important. But if I have to keep salvation as a free gift by grace, then I cannot make any attachment prerequisite to it. It's purely this. So if a person has believed in Jesus, the Bible says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's what we say. You believe in Jesus, you're saved. You're a child of God. You have, you know, as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become children of God. You received Christ, you're a child of God. You're fully saved, 100% saved. Not partly saved, you're saved, fully saved. The Bible says, he who has the Son has life. Do you have the Son? You have life. You've gone from death to life. You're 100% saved. Whether you're baptized or not has nothing to do with it. Do you believe you're saved? Now, because you believe, live a life of obedience, which is be baptized, be part of a local church, love people, forgive people, and you know all the other things that we see in the New Testament. Right? So that is working out your salvation. So I will present it to you. I'm not commanding you to obey this or follow this. I'm just sharing you my analysis. And like I said, you're free to have a different opinion or a different point of view. That's okay. Uh, I'm just sharing with you my how, why I say that water baptism. So in my analysis, water baptism is not necessary for salvation but it is an expression of your salvation, right? You, you are water baptized because you are saved and it demonstrates to the public that you are saved. So this brings us to the next question. Can a believer lose their salvation? Again, here there are two different differing opinions as I shared earlier. And these are all good people, right? I'm good people, godly people, uh, people of God. So uh, I'm not finding fault. I'm just saying that there are two different uh, positions and we need to understand both, right? So one side, there are those who say, you can never lose your salvation because it is eternal life. If God imparts eternal life to you, how can it go away? Right? It's eternal life. You have it. If your name is written in the book of life, then how can it be taken out? If you have come into the kingdom of light, how can you 
get out of it and go into the kingdom of darkness. So there are people who say, once you're saved, forever saved. And if we tell them, look, you know, you point to somebody who's, who was a believer and then they stopped coming to church and they've backslidden and they've gone back into sin and they're, you know, living terrible again. And you say, look, but look at that person. You know, for two years he was saved. He was living the life of a believer. And now he's gone back and, he, you know, whatever. He's denied the faith and all of that. Then their response usually is, well, he wasn't saved in the first place. So that is how they will respond if you point to somebody uh, who, you know, who goes through this. They will say, well, he wasn't saved in the first place. But you know, hey, he was saved. He came to the altar. He gave his life to Christ. And he was baptized. And uh, he was very much part of the church. He was reading his Bible in worship, serving God, doing everything that every believer do. But then something happened and he denied the faith. He's gone back. Uh, you know, but they will say, no, he never, his salvation experience was not genuine. That's their response. Then on the other side, you have people. So this is one side. Okay, I'm just giving you, this is one opinion, one, one position. There's the other position in the Christian church, which again, all good people, godly people, who say that salvation can be lost. And of course, there are many scriptures that they will quote that, uh, you know, uh, if you, you can receive Christ, but it's possible to, lose your salvation basically because salvation is a gift god gives you the gift itself is eternal it is eternal life that is given as a gift so the gift is eternal but you can keep the gift or you can throw it away so that doesn't change the nature of the gift it only changes whether you have it or not right so the gift itself is eternal it is eternal life but you can keep it or you can reject it, discard it. You can receive it and later discard it. So that is another position. So this is a very, very, um, what is a hotly debated subject in the Christian world. A lot of theologians, a lot of good people, you know, debate from both sides. Uh, and again, you know, I want to listen to you. I will also present my understanding. Again, I'm not presenting my understanding as this is it. I'm just saying that, look, this is how I would analyze the scriptures. I'm not, and I'm not forcing it on you, but it's good for all of us to discuss. So please feel free to share your thoughts. And then uh, at the end, I will share my thoughts. And yeah. What do you think? Um, is it possible for a believer to lose their salvation or not? Please, Collins, go ahead. First, again, I don't know whether I'm right. But, That's okay. Uh, it's okay. Just share your thoughts. No problem. It depends on the interpretation. You see, when they were writing, the uh, when they were putting the Bible into English, there are some verses of the Greek which they failed to change properly. For instance, John 3.16, it does not say whosoever believes. The true way is whosoever goes on believing. So to me, when I read that, and also my colleagues and you, Pastor, know very well, when you read that, it is like trying to mean that salvation is the process hence the name the way christian christians when christ went they were not called christians this is a pagan name you also know very well we were called the way the way we were on the way going which really would mean that uh, it is a process just as it begins but it ends when you are saved <laughs> 
the way you've lived your life and when you're dead, I think they would say so and so was real a saved man. But uh, when I read in Romans and when Paul says that uh, faith is by faith alone, and uh, it seems that they, there are no works there. And when I go to James, it says that faith without work is dead. Uh, being somehow mature in Christianity, I do understand that the work Roman, I mean, Paul was saying is quite different from what uh, James is saying. So to cut uh, the long story short, or I would say, even we remember when they were writing the, the book of Hebrews, Hebrews, we know very well that these people were in Roman, in Rome, they were going back because of the so much prostitution. I mean, persecution, people were re crucifying Jesus Christ, going back to the synagogue and saying, you know, we were no, no longer believing because we know what was happening to them. And they were denying faith after that. So I think it's hard to say, but I think it is true. A person mm. can lose his is salvation. Let me put it at that. Mm. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you for sharing those good, good insights. Thank you. I also see some, uh, Brother Manoa says, Jesus said, Matthew 7, 20 to 23, it's possible that a believer can lose the salvation if one does not endure till the end in obedience. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. Anybody else? What do you think? I mean, there's, you know, we're not, we're not here to judge each other. We're just sharing our thoughts, our learnings. Uh, maybe you have studied and you want to share some thoughts. Just share, feel free. It's okay. Silatoli says, salvation is a free gift, but I believe we can lose if they will freely renounce Jesus as Savior. Okay. Okay. Uh, but I also agree with what Silatoli also mentioned. Mm. We're reading Hebrews 10:29 um, of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. Mm. So, uh, according to that verse, maybe if a person who is rejecting the salvation and um, you know count, counts it not worthy uh, can lose salvation. Mm. 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 Only in Good. that case, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Subhashish, yes, I believe I can lose his her salvation. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else you want to share your thoughts? Okay. Good. Thank you to each of you for sharing your thoughts and insights and learnings. I think, you know, we can learn from each other as we share. And I like how Colin put it, you know, it's 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 we are on the way. That's what the believers call in the book of Acts. They are people of the way, which which is wonderful. It's like a journey. So obviously a journey is a process. You reach your destination, you know, over time. So yes, so I will share with you my understanding. You know, I believe that a believer can lose their salvation. Uh, one reason is because of the many passages that we find in the New Testament. It'll, I'll, I'll, it'll be part of the notes that I release on the classwork. But there are many passages in the New Testament. And John shared from Hebrews 10. Brother Mano shared Matthew 7, like that. You know, uh, Paul also writes about people who've made shipwreck of their faith. That means they were on the journey, but along the way, it's like a ship, you know, crash, shipwreck of their faith. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, the writer of Hebrews mentions it in Hebrews 6 and also in Hebrews 10. John, the beloved disciple, mentions it in 1 John chapter 5. Uh, so there are several, not just one or two, but you know, five or six maybe scripture passages that are talking about people who once believed but have gone back. Now, we know that just because somebody sins, they don't lose their salvation, right? Like just because somebody makes a mistake, does something wrong, doesn't mean they lost their salvation. That is not what we're talking about. But these passages are describing people who have 
literally gone back or as uh, Peter would put it or Jude would put it, you know, they have um, become like dogs who go back to the vomit, you know. It's like they've gone back to their old ways. So that, that's pretty pretty strong words that Peter uses and Jude uses. So from all of these writers, and not just Paul, but like I said, Paul, Peter, Jude, John, uh, others, uh, it's like, okay, when you look at all these passages, then you say like, okay, so the Bible is teaching, the New Testament is teaching that uh, it is possible for somebody to believe, experience salvation, and then turn away because of all these scriptures that you see. So I will, I'll put that list of scripture. I'll give it to you in the notes. But so that's one reason. And second is, you know, like we mentioned, or I think even Zilatoli says that, you know, it's uh, a gift, a gift can be received, but it can also be discarded. It doesn't change the value of the gift. It doesn't change what the gift is. It is eternal life. I can receive it. I can discard it. So that is uh, in my control or the act of my will. And God will never override you know, a person's choice. So I, I believe, this is my position, that um, based on what we see in the New Testament, many passages, that uh, it is possible. But I won't fight. I won't fight with somebody who's on the other side because some very good godly Christian leaders uh, are on the other side, which they believe a person can never lose their salvation. It's okay. We will still be brothers. Uh, we will still shake hands and we will still serve God together. But it's okay. It's just that uh, uh, how they reconcile these difficult pa these passages, which I mentioned, uh, I don't know. But for me, these passages are very obvious. Uh, and it's okay that, you know, we may not agree on this. It's okay. Uh, but we are still, you know, part of the same body of Christ and we can still love each other and serve God together. So we're not going to fight about it, but we understand there are different positions. Okay. Yeah. So that's it. Um, we, I've, let me see now, I've covered these two questions on salvation. Yeah. Then there are, you know, some other things which which will which will be in the notes, which I, I don't want to discuss. But it's like about drinking alcohol, and <laughs> what clothing to wear, and uh, tattoos, and uh, those kinds of uh, things, or keeping of the Sabbath. Uh, they they will be in the notes. You can just read it, uh, and uh, I, I just share. Uh, what my understanding of uh, the scriptures are on these matters. But, uh, it, it, you know, um, I don't want to get too hard on this because, uh, you know, uh, there are different positions and we don't want to fight with each other about can you have tattoos or if you have tattoos, will you go to hell? Or, you know, we don't want to fight about it. I can share, each one can share their ideas, but I think we should respect uh, on these non-essential things, you know, we respect each other's ideas. Okay, some believe some people may uh, be okay with tattoos. Some people not okay uh, about the clothing. You know, uh, people have different points of view. It's okay. Let's not fight about it. Uh, that, that it's not necessary. Uh, different parts of the world they have different clothing, uh, different style of dressing. So let's not. Uh, you know, argue about it, but there is certain guidance in the Bible. We follow that and then the rest, leave it to people. You decide, you know, uh, about the clothing. Uh, so things like that. But I just share, you know, the scriptures and some thoughts, but we respect each other's differing views and we don't want to fight about uh, those kinds of things. Same thing about the Sabbath. You know, I, I share 
basically the New Testament teaches we don't observe the Sabbath, but some people will feel, you know, I have to do this. Okay, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Uh, we are respectful. We will not argue. Uh, let's, you know, be respectful of each other's positions on things that don't matter. You know, so it's okay. All right, so we will pause here for today. Uh, we will, uh, with this, you know, I bring this course to a close. Uh, what I would, what we will do is I will put out the assignment for you. Uh, look at the assignment as a review of the course, okay? So it'll start from the beginning. It'll just simple questions to take you through the course. Uh, so you just, and it's going to be an open book uh, thing. So you don't have to memorize anything. You can keep your PDFs open, keep your Bible open, and just, uh, it's its going to be uh, a, a multiple choice. That means it's, you just select the right answers. The only thing I want to warn you is one question can have more than one right answer. And that is purposely because I want to make you think, right? So there may be four options. Three are correct, one may be wrong. So you have to mark all the three. Okay, so don't just mark one and say, well, I, I ticked one. No, you have to mark all three, right? So that's the only tricky part. Uh, otherwise, uh, the assessment is going to be very simple. It's an open book, open Bible assessment. You could use all the resources. Uh, but think, be careful, because uh, out of four, and uh, maybe two are correct. So you have to mark both. Or maybe three are correct. So you have to mark all three. Okay, so that's the only thing you have to be careful about. And it's look at it as a review of the course. Just go through the whole course. Um, just refresh yourself. And then most importantly, make use of it. Make use of what we learned in this course as you study the Bible, right? Uh, don't forget the guidelines we learned and apply it, apply it. And that's the best way to uh, learn how to interpret scripture correctly. Okay. So any final questions before we close our session? Okay. So I would uh, request somebody, uh, I want to thank all of you for being part of this course. Uh, we have good news that in August our campus will open. So uh, there will be you know, students who want to come and study on the campus can come and do that. Online classes will continue. E-learning classes will continue. So we will have three options. Uh, and uh, you know, I look forward to seeing all of you again uh, in, 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 in August in our course in our courses for the second year, all right? Uh, before that, we will have the assessment and we will close off this semester. Could somebody please um, lead us in prayer and then we will close? Anybody could pray with us, please. Who wants to pray? Um, let's pray. Go ahead. Loving Father, once more, Lord, we thank you so much for this beautiful morning. Lord, thank you for speaking to us. And especially, Lord, I thank you for your servant, Lord. Thank you so much, that, Lord. We could be able to learn how to interpret the scriptures. And Lord, I especially pray whatever the things, Lord, we have uh, heard and learned, Lord, during these uh, days. Bless us, Lord. We will be able to implement it in our life and ministry, Lord. Once again, I thank you so much for our dear pastor. Continuously bless him, bless his family, bless his ministry, Lord. Thank you so much for hearing us. Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 All right. Um, thank you, everyone. So we will not have any more lectures. Please use the remaining weeks just to do the assessment. We'll be up in a couple of days and uh, enjoy the rest of the month of April. And I'll hope to see all of you soon 
in, in our next semester. Okay? God bless. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you. God bless each one. Thank you. Bye now. See you again soon.